We now return to locomotives on Modern Marvels. By the 1930s, the sounds of the steam locomotive began to fade as designers looked to new technologies. In 1934, Electromotive launched a line of diesel-electric streamliner locomotives that were easier to maintain and cheaper to fuel than the coal-fed steamers. Today, diesel-electric locomotives have a different look, but they are still the industry standard. Companies like Electromotive Diesel in London, Ontario, build hundreds of them every year for the international market. And every one starts from the bottom up with a single steel bed plate. What we see here is a domestic bed plate. It's approximately one and three quarter inches thick, 70 feet long, and six feet wide. And it weighs approximately 30,000 pounds. The upside down underframe eventually lands in the assembly area. Here, some of the major components are lowered into place. So what we see here is the compressed air tanks that supply the compressed air for the locomotive as well as the rail cars. And above us, what we see is the loading of a 5,000 gallon fuel tank, which is our domestic fuel tank. Tighten a few bolts, and the underside of the locomotive is just about locked down. Meanwhile, workers are assembling other parts throughout the plant. Like this upside down wheel assembly. A combination of wheels, gear, axle, and electric motor. This is where the electric part of the diesel electric locomotive comes in. Put three wheel assemblies together, and you've got a bogey. And this bogey is about to take its first spin, up and over, until it's right side up. Then it's off to final assembly, where the underframe is taking a twirl of its own. Set the underframe on top of a set of bogies, lower the cab into place, and all this loco needs is some motive. Yep, this is the diesel part. What we see here is a diesel engine that we use on one of our locomotives. Uh, compared to a normal car engine, a car engine runs around four to six cylinders, roughly about this size, compared to the cylinders that we use here, and we use 16 of them. When we talk about this engine, it weighs approximately 40,000 pounds compared to a local car engine, which is much less than that, obviously. Also, a local car engine would take around 200 horsepower, whereas this guy right here, our workhorse, runs around 4,300 horsepower. From, from here, we use the overhead cranes to remove the engine off the stand and deck it onto one of our units. On board, mechanics hook up the engine to an eight-ton alternator. And the diesel-electric locomotive is ready to rumble. And when it does, here's how it will work. The diesel engine sends mechanical power to the alternator. The alternator transforms that power into electricity. The electricity is then sent to the electric traction motors on each wheel assembly. The motors turn the wheels, which apply power to the track. In the locomotive business, power on the track is measured in tractive effort. The more traction that can be applied between wheel and rail, the more pulling power on the locomotive. Central detractive effort is managing friction. And the secret lies in the simplest of substances. What we want here is we want to have good friction on the surface of the wheel where it contacts the actual rail. So how we increase the frictional force between these two surfaces is we use this nozzle and we actually pour sand into this area. What that does is it increases the frictional force, thus allowing more tractive effort to be placed on the rail. While the sand increases friction to the bottom of the wheel, just inches away, the wheel flange gets a rub with a clever little device that decreases friction. Here's the frictional force that we don't want. That's between this surface of the wheel and the inner surface of the rail. So what we've done to counteract that is we have this flange lube dispenser that has a graphite-based lubricant that makes contact with this surface. What it does is it applies it as the wheel turns and thus reduces the frictional force between this surface of the wheel and the rail itself. Here we are next to a completed domestic locomotive. The locomotive is 75 feet long, 16 feet high, and 10 feet wide. The locomotive itself weighs 425,000 pounds. It's really the workhorse out there in the industry. But before each of its workhorses is turned loose, 
It gets ridden hard out on the test track. So there's full throttle eight. You see the tractive effort build up. This is good. This is a good engine. It'll pull like crazy. A modern diesel electric locomotive can move one ton of freight, an average of 202 miles on a gallon of diesel fuel. A modern 18-wheeler truck can only move a ton of freight 59 miles on the same gallon. Locomotives will return on Modern Marvels. We now return to Locomotives on Modern Marvels. This is TTCI's Transportation Technology Center outside Pueblo, Colorado. The place where the Federal Railroad Administration conducts research. And locomotive manufacturers send their technicians to test their latest designs. To watch train wrecks. And to study the effects for safety and future development. One of the things that we do here at TTCI is to conduct crash tests. That's one of the abilities that we have at an isolated site like that. And we've done that right on the tracks right behind me here. In the real world, locomotive crashes like this are rare. And whether the other vehicle is a car or truck that tried to run a crossing, or a train that was mistakenly switched to the wrong track, the outcome is always the same. The locomotive wins. As this crash test shows, the damage caused by the locomotive climbing up and over the train car is extensive and possibly life-threatening to the engineer sitting in the cab. By studying crash test video, manufacturers like Electromotive Diesel, or EMD, are able to develop ways to reduce the risks. Even during the mother of all crashes, a head-on between two locomotives. For head-on collisions, we've developed a, an anti-climber. This whole structure is the anti-climber. It is designed to resist a strong upward force here and here and keep the coupler from coming up over the main structure here and the other car going into the cab. When two locomotives without the anti-climber collide head-on, the locomotive with more momentum can slide straight up and into the other's cab. But if one locomotive has an anticlimber, the coupler from the other locomotive catches underneath the anticlimber, stopping upward motion and diverting the energy laterally. The EMD anticlimber, first used in 1989, is now the industry standard. The crashworthiness of the locomotive used in North America is the best that's ever been largely as a result of the kinds of tests that we do here, the activities of people like EMD in applying that information into the design of their cab. Out on the TTCI test track, EMD engineers are evaluating their newest design element, what they call the isolated cab. Their goal is to have the quietest cab in the business. We're trying to control the working environment. The whole purpose is to keep the noise down inside the cab from the 4,500 horsepower that's just 20 feet behind us. EMD has tried to reduce the noise and vibration inside the cab by separating it from the engine compartment. To record the decibel level, technicians have hung microphones at ear level throughout the cab. The target is 80 decibels or less. Then it's time to open up the throttle to see if the isolated mounts work. Even at full throttle, the sound level barely exceeds 75 decibels. About the same as a normal conversation between two people. And a victory for the EMD designers. And while they're here, the crew is also collecting ride quality data by testing the cab for vibration. The whole cab has a number of sensors all over the cab, one of which is right here, where we um, measure the cab's seat base vibration in all three directions, up and down, four and a half, side to side. Technicians record the data in a test car behind the locomotive. Later, EMD will use the data to develop even more ways to improve its locomotives and keep its operating engineers safe. In another area of the test facility, TTCI offers locomotive makers a way to look through steel with its automated cracked wheel detection system. The system uses sound waves to take a snapshot of a locomotive's wheels as they pass through an ultrasonic sensor. Right now, 
This first wheel is going to be picked up by this inspection site. It's going to follow it all the way through. Once it follows it through, it's going to reset itself, set up for the next wheel that comes through. It'll pick it up. It'll send ultrasonic energy up through the wheel and inspect the wheel for cracks. And then that information will be transmitted into our computer bungalow. Inside the bungalow, the results appear on a computer screen in real time. Each rectangular box represents a wheel. The lines reveal some type of flaw. Right here, you're showing some thermal cracks in the locomotive wheel. Here, you're showing a horizontal crack. So then it triggers the maintenance crew on what they need to do in order to correct that. Whereas TTCI exists to help find a locomotive's flaws, a network of service stations across the United States stands ready to fix them. One of the best is the CSX Maintenance Facility in Waycross, Georgia. CSX Transportation runs the largest railroad operation in the eastern United States. Every day, thousands of CSX locomotives traverse the country, hauling freight. Keeping them operational is crucial to the bottom line. Time is money, and these locomotives cost about $2 million a piece, and if they're setting, we're not utilizing that asset. We can service as many as 12 at one time. This is simply a service station for locomotives. And this service station is built for speed. It's kind of like a NASCAR pit stop for locomotives. The moment a locomotive pulls in, a team of workers moves into place. The aim is to get it in and out in under an hour. And this is where it starts here at the Locomotive Services Center. We'll service anywhere from 75 to 100 locomotives in this facility per day. Here's where the sand will be going in. It'll be coming in through a funnel that he'll put in. Here we have a gentleman that's going to be changing a flange loop stick to help with the flange wear. We're going into curves on the track. Here the gentleman's checking the oil and the water. Uh, he's going to make sure everything is uh, in good running repair with the diesel engine. Here we are adding fuel to the locomotive. The locomotive fuel tank will hold anywhere from about 1,500 gallons up to 4,500 gallons. At this facility, we will pump about 100,000 gallons of diesel fuel a day. His workers handle the basics from above. Others are busy in the service pit below. As they're working up above, they're also going to be changing brake shoes down below. Warren is going to be pulling this brake shoe out and going to be replacing it with a new brake shoe. You have to remove the brake key, take the old brake shoe out, replace it with a new brake shoe, and then drop the brake key back in that holds the brake shoe in place. And it's ready to go. Here we have a worn brake shoe that is in need of being replaced. Here we have a new brake shoe that we will put in its place. The new brake shoe should last approximately three to four weeks, depending on the amount of traffic the locomotive is involved in. Of course, there are times when some heavy lifting is required. For those cases, locomotives make a trip to the back shop, where mechanics carry out everything from cosmetic repair to complete engine rebuilds. We do lots of accident damage. Uh, that could be crossing accidents uh, that happen uh, out on the line of road. We change main alternators, and uh, we just do lots and lots of work, more or less rebuild the locomotive in that area. Once most locomotives are cleared to return to action, they get a final sprucing up with a quick shower in the CSX wash. It gets a lot of the road film off of them because after all, CSX, that's what's on the side of the locomotives. We're proud of our company and we certainly want to look good in the public's eye. In 1896, 40,000 spectators watched two unmanned steam locomotives crash head on during a publicity stunt in central Texas. Flying debris from the impact killed three spectators and injured six more. It was the last publicity stunt of its kind. Locomotives will return on Modern Marvels.